Bitch. <laughs> so, all right. Okay. Can well, everyone hear me? I can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, I guess I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm a, a, a pharmaceutical chemist. Um, my research uh, in grad school and my postdoc was in arsenic, and I currently sit as the uh, chair of the Akron section of the American Chemical Society. So I'm going to tell a, a story of um, America's other uh, mask crisis. Um, and it's, it's, I'm going to do my best to keep the story in Cleveland, but we might range around the country just a little bit. So without further ado, Gas Masks, Neela Park, and the Cleveland Mousetrap. Um, so let's talk about the first uh, mask uh, crisis uh, that everyone's familiar with. Um, you know, we don't have enough N95 cloth masks that are be keep being used. Um, there have been studies that have been published and webinars that I've attended on which fabrics to use, uh, which have the best performance. Um, these are really the evolution of the uh, plague doctor's mask from the 1700s. Um, and the best filtration, just to get it out there, is uh, through a uh, uh, mechanical filtration and then a second layer with electrostatic filtration. Um, another slide I thought that was relevant was um, in, uh, you know, hot uh, environments, the um, aerosol droplets in the air evaporate quickly to less than one micrometer, which is why it can get down into the lungs. If it's greater than five micrometer, um, aerosols stay in the upper respiratory tracts and the fine aerosols, less than one micrometer, um, get into the lower respiratory tract. Um, but that's enough about today's mass crisis. Let's talk about World War I, also known as the Chemist War. So the chemist war really began in Nipra in 1915 when a special unit of the German uh, military released um, cylinders of chlorine gas which drifted over the battlefield and caught the French uh, unprepared um, and opened up a, a six mile wide um, hole in the, in the defensive uh, trenches. Um, Germany was also unprepared as that they weren't um, expecting uh, such devastation and, and were not able to advance. And within a few days, uh, both armies were back at the same positions that they were um, before the uh, chlorine attack. But the, the uh, chemical weapons escalated throughout the war. Um, this picture on the left is a hypo helmet. So once chlorine was identified as the agent that the Germans used, um, these masks were quickly fabricated. They were soaked in thiosulfate, sodium bicarb, glycerin and had a mica uh, mask to see through. Um, and these neutralized chlorine, of course, uh, worse gases were yet to come. Um, so there were really four different types of, um, of uh, gases used in, in the war gas. There was a tear gas, um, chlorine, there's asphyxiants such as uh, phosgene and, and diphosgene, um, sternutators um, like, like uh, chloropicrin, and uh, mustard gas, um, which, which affected the uh, soldiers through their skin. Now, um, the gas war started in 1915, but the U.S. didn't join the war until um, 1917, April 2nd. Um, but they had been investigating asphyxiating gases. Uh, really, the uh, Bureau of Mines had the most experience dealing with asphyxiating gases in the, uh, in the mines. And they were put in charge of the, uh, both the offensive and the defensive uh, development. Um, they moved into the American University, which was three years old at the time, um, graduated their first class, and then they turned their campus over to, to, the, uh, to the US military. Um, this testing became known as the American University Experimental Station. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, but first we wanna bring it into Cleveland. Um, um, research was across the entire country, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, John Hopkins, Harvard, Yale, but gas mass development moved to um, Cleveland um, to an innovation hub named Neela Park. Um, part of this had to do with the fact that the Cleveland mayor, Newton Deal Baker, from 1912 to 1915 had become a secretary of war in 1916. But it also had to do with the fact that um, 
the experts at the National Lampworks Company and the National Carbon Company knew more about charcoal, which is used to neutralize the chemicals um, than anyone else in the country. So the development came here to Cleveland. <clears throat> um, and besides the chemical process, um, the mass had to be designed for active uses. So you can see the soldiers jumping over each other on the right. This is a uh, way to test the per um, peripheral vision of uh, different mass designs. And <clears throat> after much trial and error, um, this is the <clears throat> Doughboy gas mask that was uh, sent to uh, Europe with our troops. You can see the uh, U.S. Marine on the, on the right wearing the, wearing the mask. Um, besides being an academic tr um, problem, this was really an industrial problem. Three weeks after the um, U.S. Uh, declared war against Germany, the order came in for one million masks, um, which had to be designed from scratch, um, tested, and it was, besides an academic problem, it was also an industrial problem. Um, manufacturing had to, um, you know, be on a scale where, you know, the wartime urgency, they could produce a million masks very quickly. Um, and of course, the, the U.S. was behind both the British and the French. Um, the British used what was known as a small box respirator, and the French mask was the M2. The U.S. mask was modeled after the British mask. And it was very specific. Each mask had to be assembled um, very precisely and consistently. Um, the charcoal came from red cedar at a Pennsylvania coking plant. Soda lime, which was used to neutralize carbon dioxide, came from the General um, Chemical Company, also in Pennsylvania. Simmons Hardware made the knapsacks that they were carried in. Each soldier was issued two masks. Um, B.F. Goodrich in Akron made the face pieces. The American Can Company um, in New York made the canisters. An assembly of all these parts occurred in Long Island. Um, and despite the best efforts, the, the U.S. was not ready when they entered the war and the first soldiers were deployed with Canadian masks. Um, but, but we did get together a quality mask in short order. Um, so this is Neela Park today. Um, it's still the site of uh, GE Lighting. Um, it's a uh, sprawling 96-acre um, campus. Um, it, was, it was built in 1910 as really the first industrial park. <clears throat> NEOA stands for the National Electric Lamp Association. Um, and it entered the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. Um, it's known locally as the University of Light because of the dazzling Christmas light display they do. Um, last year was the 96th year in a row where you could drive through NEOA Park and see the light display. Um, and a little bit of... Um, Providence, it was sold yesterday. So if this is the first you're hearing of this, Savant Systems has bought Neela Park. Um, GE Lighting will be keeping their headquarters here in Cleveland. Um, so that was a little bit of surprising news that, that I was able to sneak a slide in about it. Okay, so we're going to bring it back to Cleveland, but for a minute we're going to talk about the offensive gas development. Um, this is a picture of the 6th Infantry Division. So here is American University. Uh, this is the um, McKinley Hall, which was the uh, main chemistry laboratory for the Bureau of Mines, and then later reorganized into the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service. Um, another building, Mal Maloney Lab, was used for um, development. And remember, these, these gain, gain, uh, gases were very dangerous. In fact, the more dangerous, the better for the purposes of uh, using as a warfare agent. Um, this is a small scale uh, laboratory apparatus for making a compound known as lewisite. Um, these experiments had to be moved to the roof for safety reasons. Um, so around um, American University is, was a lot of uh, farmland and a model of the Verdun trenches were made. Um, so there were two circular trenches um, one inside the other, and they, they modeled uh, lethality and behavior under battlefield conditions. Um, and this is a picture of the trenches in uh, Spring Valley, Washington, D.C. Um, future gas officers would come to the university uh, for training. 
Um, this was a, um, a release of a gas as part of the training. Um, okay, so we'll talk about uh, Lewis side a little bit more. Winford Lewis um, was a professor in uh, Northwestern. Um, he joined the, um, the Chemical Warfare Service. In fact, 10% um, of all American chemists would eventually be involved with the warfare, um, the gas warfare division which sprawled from not just offensive to defensive, but uh, an effort to provide uh, helium out of our Texas mines um, for uh, Zeppelins over uh, the battlefield, which gave uh, the British an advantage. Uh, the British were buying um, 1 million cubic feet of uh, helium from, from Americas per week. Um, so Winford Lewis became aware of a uh, compound that was suggested by Reverend John Grisham in April of 1918. Um, after several explosions and setbacks, he was able to isolate an amber oily liquid, which had the odor of geranium blossoms. And this compound was known as Lewisite after, after um, um, Winford Lewis. And it was said that a single drop on the back of the hand was fatal. Um, bringing it back to uh, Akron, he declined a position as chief research chief with uh, B.F. Goodrich in uh, 1933. Um, so go... Reverend John Griffin, um, who was he? He was the uh, PhD advisor at the Catholic University of Julius Aloysius uh, Newland. Um, Newland is famous also with an Akron connection. Uh, he's in the National Inventors Hall of Fame for his discovery of uh, synthetic rubber, which was divinyl acetylene. And his PhD was essentially um, 75 compounds that I reacted with acetylene. Um, and one of those compounds was arsenic trichloride. Um, the reaction um, gave off toxic fumes and new one was hospitalized for several days. And he wrote in his dissertation that he never worked with it again. Uh, this was 1903, it sat on the shelf until it was brought to the attention of the uh, uh, chemical warfare service. Uh, this is the molecular structure of Lewisite. It's, um, um, chlorovinyl arsine dichloride. And it was uh, selected for further development um, because it was not uh, as persistent as uh, mustard gas. There was a real effort to um, you know, prove uh, Americans' ability in this, this field. The Germans had been um, ahead of both the British and the French for some time. Um, but one of the disadvantages of mustard gas was that it was an area of denial um, weapon. So once you sprayed mustard on the uh, battlefield, neither you nor your enemy could use it. Um, Lewisite would dissipate. It would actually catch fire with, uh, with water. So within a matter of a day or so, you could enter a battlefield sprayed with Lewisite. Um, it was also exceedingly toxic. Um, so experiments progressed in Washington, D.C. until August of 1918. So you can, you can see the pace was pretty frantic. It was first brought to the attention of the uh, Warfare Service in, 19, in uh, April. And by August, they were already um, exploring uh, Lewisite um, shells and a faulty timer on a bomb went off. And remember this is in um, um, Washington DC, a very urban area. Um, it was still a farm, but it was in the middle of, um, you know, trolley lines and uh, some residences. And a cloud of Lewisite came down um, um, the hill here, this is called uh, Mustard Hill. And the former Senator Nathan B. Scott and his wife and his sister-in-law were sitting on their porch when they were gassed. They were able to um, uh, run inside and only, uh, only one of them was hospitalized. Um, shortly after the accident, um, nearly killing a uh, former US Senator, Lewis site work at the university ceased. And where did they move it? Um, they moved it to Cleveland. So a little bit more about Spring Valley, Washington, D.C. Um, I mentioned it was a, um, it had a model of the Verdun battlefield. They did chemical west, weapons testing. Um, gas would be coming out of the trenches as trolleys would be driving by um, on Massachusetts Avenue. Um, after the war ended, the War Department filled the pits and trenches with their leftover uh, weapons and uh, since then, this area has become a residential community with 600,000 plus homes. 1993, a cache of buried weapons was discovered, which has led to a 
20 year cleanup with more than 141 munitions um, discovered. This is the only um, residential area in America that was formerly a chemical weapons um, facility. Um, so here you see scientists looking for um, uh, ground penetrating radar to try and find, uh, in this picture they're looking for um, one notorious pit that was known as uh, Hades Pit, um, which has never been located. Um, although there are pictures of it, it has never been located. Um, this is a, a residential house having their yard dung up by the uh, Army Corps of uh, Engineers. Okay, bringing it back to Cleveland. Um, Jim Kinnant was the head of one of the research units at the American University. And his group perfected the uh, lewisite manufacturing process. Um, the trick was using hydrochloric acid to desensitize the uh, reaction mixture, remove the aluminum chloride catalyst, and this was able to prevent explosion. Um, chemical was given the name methyl, which prior to its uh, um, designation in August of 1918, methyl had been used uh, to designate mustard gas. So the records are very confusing as they had both had the same code name. Um, Lewisite was chosen for the uh, spring offensive that was to take place in 1919. General Siebert staff calculated that 3,000 tons of Lewisite would instigate a German surrender. Uh, Jim Kinnant was promoted to a major and ordered to Cleveland to oversee the operations. Uh, he arrived in July of 1918 and began the production um, and the development of a 30-acre site uh, surrounding the former Ben-Hur Motor Company in Willoughby. Um, and he was uh, forced to lie to his uh, research group and to tell them that the work on Lewis site had to be abandoned because it was just too dangerous. Um, but instead he came to Cleveland. Um, now many people might recognize the name Jim Kinnant. Um, he's more famous for his uh, work during World War II. He was a scientific advisor to Roosevelt. Um, many consider him to be the uh, architect of the atomic bomb. He, uh, he became the uh, president of Harvard University and uh, advisor to Roosevelt, uh, he's the one who hired Oppenheimer. Um, so he became um, much more famous for his work during World War II, but his World War I connection was here in Cleveland. So building the uh, mousetrap in Ju July uh, 20th, uh, Conan arrives in Cleveland. Um, Colonel Dorsey from the National Lamp Works um, arranged to um, pay all construction costs because it would have taken too long to wire the money. Remember, we're talking about uh, 1917 technology um, from Washington to Cleveland. Um, the first 25 soldiers were assigned. They began clearing weeds, stringing barbed wire, and pitching tents. Um, the mayor of Willoughby, uh, Mayor Carmichael, suspended all construction products in the city and sent all the city's tradesmen to work at the factory. By uh, August 1st, the factory floor paving had begun. Um, Jim Cannon found a Cleveland foundry able to build 1,300-gallon uh, glass line steel reactors with automatic stirs. Um, on August 13th, a uh, contractor from Painesville died, moving heavy shel shelving. He would be the only uh, death at the Cleveland mousetrap. By the end of August, the uh, Cleveland Construction Company had started building barracks in a mess hall, but the first barrack wasn't, wasn't ready until early October. Um, and many considered the conditions at the camp to be worse than prison conditions with the soldiers having to sleep in uh, tents and march into the city um, to be fed. Um, of the 22 officers and 542 enlisted men who were eventually assigned to Willoughby, um, only a handful of um, uh, two or three knew the entire scope of the mission from the outset. And this type of compartmentalization um, was also done at Los Alamos and Oak Ridge and Hanford uh, during World War II. A Cleveland Post Office box, lock drawer 426, was used at the uh, mailing address. The security at the plant was so tight, tight that the um, soldiers dubbed it as the mousetrap, as in what goes in never comes out. The uh, procurement was run by Lieutenant Gracie, um, who was responsible for ordering supplies. For example, three tons of sulfuric acid had to be delivered every day to remove water from the acetylene, which was purchased from the National Carbon Company. And many of the uh, precursors, such as arsenic trichloride, were nearly as dangerous as lewisite. 
Um, here's a picture from the uh, um, Western Reserve Historical Society of the barracks at the Mousetrap. Um, here are some of the soldiers um, who worked on the uh, Lewis site. And a um, couple more uh, soldiers. Uh, the, the production was so dangerous that they would have to don full uh, body protective equipment uh, shown on the right. So uh, here's a sign. Of, um, whenever I show this slide, I, I always feel like Colin Powell. This is where the Americans built their chemical weapons. Uh, you have um, Vine Street here and Route 2 here. And you can see where the, uh, the, the soil is a little bit um, red. Um, this is the site of the, uh, the, the, Dew, of, uh, the Dew of Death manufacturing site. Um, so one comment about the red. Um, so arsenic uh, contamination is a problem throughout the world um, because it is a ge geological source. Um, so there was a prize in the uh, 2000s called the Granger Challenge Prize. Um, and it was to design a, um, a low technology solution to remove um, arsenic from uh, groundwater, which was naturally occurring. And the winner was a um, professor from George Mason named Abul Hussam, who came up with a three-stage filter where you filter the water through coarse sand and then fine sand, and then finally through a composite iron matrix. Um, and the iron bonds the arsenic strongly. Um, it doesn't have to be disposed of as hazardous waste. It can go right in the landfill because the arsenic is, is uh, permanently bonded to uh, the iron. So uh, Professor Hussam won the Granger Challenge Prize, which came with a million dollars in 2007. He used all of the money to build filters, and now thousands of these filters are used um, in Bangladesh. Why am I talking about this? Because if you have a site that was manufacturing chemical weapons, it's very convenient that now the site is an iron recycling plant. Um, and and it, it seems to me that the reddish tint um, is uh, iron, which is an excellent thing for binding any residual arsenic. All right. Um, so in 1970, a, a reminiscence letter was sent to the Lake County Historical Society um, Simpson describes reporting to the Cleveland YMCA, and then after a few days, he and two other soldiers board the trolley um, to take him to a town he had never heard of 20 miles east of Cleveland. During the trip, the conductor told Simpson that he had taken over 100 GIs to Willoughby, but had never brought a single one back. Once he arrived, he was told he would be court-martialed if, if he disclosed where he was stationed, and all of his mail was censored and sent through the... Uh, the lock drawer in Cleveland. Work began every day at 6 a.m. as Major Canant sang all up into the public address system. Each day, soldiers moved, uh, marched in, into town for lunch and dinner. The soldiers equaled about 25% of the entire population. The townspeople donated mattresses, blankets, and even a, a piano. Um, so within a few months, November 11, the um, the Germans signed the armistice and the war was over. Um, the plant learned about the armistice as townspeople approached the base. And some people think that the um, surprise surrender of Germany was due to um, their knowledge that Lewis site would be unleashed uh, or another um, unnamed chemical agent would be released on the, in the spring. Um, so a couple more things about the, the mousetrap site. Um, in an effort to explain away all of the activity in the foul odors, uh, Jim Conant lied to the town mayor and told them they were making a new form of rubber. Um, although there were several accidents during the production, um, and some of the men suffered, suffered painful Lewis site burns, um, there was not a single death during production. By November of 1918 and the end of the war, the site was up to full production of 10 tons a day. So after the war ended, um, Lewis site gained a little bit of uh, notoriety. Um, this is an article in the uh, New York Times. Um, it talks about our, our super poison gas, um, the great American gas that would have won the war. Um, it was never used in the war, uh, but it was reported to be 72 times deadlier than uh, mustard. So the uh, amount of Lewis site that was prepared at the uh, Willoughby site um, is, is, uh, is up for a little bit of debate. Um, 
<clears throat> a contemporary article in the Cleveland Dispatch reported that there was 300 tons of lewisite on the site at the end of the war. And that these barrels were loaded into a uh, uh, the most heavily guarded train um, that ever existed. All traffic was cleared off of the train lines and the uh, train proceeded to Baltimore. The only person on the train who was not uh, military was the conductor. Um, it proceeded at 10 miles an hour to Baltimore where the barrels were loaded onto a uh, barge taken 50 miles out in the ocean and pushed into the sea. Uh, remember this is 1917, there was no hazardous waste disposal. The only two options were really to push it into a body of water or the second procedure, which was called burn and bury. Um, an anecdotal report was made by an elderly Willoughby resident who remembers his father telling a story that shortly after World War I, he was hired by, an arm, by the army to dump drums and material in the lake. Um, there, are, there are no uh, records of this other than the anecdotal report. And it's also likely that this was not Lewis site, um, but maybe a precursor, which is also not accounted for. Um, here's a picture of the site. Uh, um, shortly after the war, the uh, site was sold to the Ohio Rubber Company, um, which occupied it till 1980. 1980. Um, a friend of mine grew up um, a little bit downwind and he recalls uh, when they were in full operation, sometimes they would get black snow from all the particulate. Um, it was shut down in 1980 for multiple uh, EPA violations. Um, a couple more items out of history. In 1957, 35 laboratory bottles were discovered. Um, it was reported that these bottles contained 50% lewisite and 50% water. But we know this is incorrect because lewisite will ignite uh, in flame as soon as it touches water. Um, in 1980, this became the DeMilta Iron and Metal site. Um, in 2002, the Army Corps of Engineers started studying this. Um, so this is a picture I took uh, a couple days ago of the uh, current site. Um, the only thing that remains of the mousetrap is the water tower with uh, the DeMilta logo on it now. Um, so what is the legacy of the of death? Um, again, the, the, um, the science that was done at the uh, mousetrap uh, became very famous after the war. Um, in 1919, the Department of Interior Hosted an exhibition where uh, they displayed a vial of this uh, poison under heavy guard. Um, in 1921, the formula for lewisite and the synthesis was published in, in Britain. And uh, this led to all major combatants in World War II stockpiling it. 1925, it was used uh, commercially. You could, you could buy a vault security device for your bank from the Anakin Lock and Alarm Company. Um, and stock sensitive um, um, controls that would break open a vial of Lewis if you tried to enter. Uh, Professor Maxwell Lefroy used Lewisite as an insecticide. Um, he started Rentokill, which is still the largest extermination company in Britain. And he was eventually um, uh, killed by uh, his experiments with Lewisite. In 1925, the chemical weapons uh, Geneva Protocol was, was uh, ratified was agreed to, um, which was not ratified in the U.S. until 1975. 1936, Mussolini used uh, lewisite uh, being sprayed from airplanes in Ethiopia. In the 1940s, a intense um, British research effort led to the rationally designed chelator, British anti-lewisite, which is still used for heavy metal um, poisoning. By the 1950s, a chemical nerve agents such as sarin, um, and VX had been developed and lewisite was declared obsolete. Currently in 1997, the uh, chemical weapons ban has been ratified by all countries except Israel, Egypt, North Korea, and South Sudan. So um, before I leave you, I have a proposal for you. I know this group was heavily involved with the March for Science in Cleveland in 2017 and 2019. Um, this is a picture of my son and I who participated um, our position was that aluminum should not be on the right of the periodic, periodic table. It should be moved to the left of the, with the other metals. Um, we carried around these signs. It was a lot of great fun. Um, since 2018, the March for Science um, still exists in Washington. It's become a scavenger hunt. 
but it has not uh, occurred. And I really think that it is um, a sad thing that we gave up this microphone as uh, scientists. So I have a uh, proposal for, for a fall activity. Um, this is the March for Science Atonement around, this, around the mousetrap. Um, you can see several different um, um, restaurants and bars. Um, and my idea is to hold a series of lectures um, talking about bad science and not just necessarily about data integrity or a misinterpretation of results, but uh, dark science such as chemical weapons and the such. And I really feel like as scientists, uh, one of the ways to build trust um, from the wider community is to talk honestly about our faults and our shortcomings. And I hope that um, I find a couple other people to help me organize this event. Uh, with that, I will um, turn it back to Patricia. Well, thank you so much. Uh, are there, uh, we will, we will, we can talk more about this. It's an interesting idea. Uh, the Cleveland STEM Fest might even be interested. Um, let's, uh, let's hear, are there questions? You'll have to unmute your own microphones because we're having a little technical issue. Actually, I think I can unmute people. Oh, can you? Oh, good. Wow, a lot of people here. Yeah. Look at all those people, yay. This is Mark Gibbon. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I have a question about the face mask. I just read something today where it seems that someone is experimenting with using some kind of electric currents and face masks to kill the virus. Would that work? It sounds like the virus is pretty easy to kill. So sure. I mean, you might uh, singe your nose hairs a little bit, but uh, why not? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, try. Um, this is Barb Fidel. I wanted to ask if the Spanish flu pandemic affected the research, at, you know, how they had to conduct things in Willoughby and on this project. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was um, 1918. Um, so the, the Spanish flu was uh, um, ravaging, um, you know, the entire world. But remember, the Spanish flu, the second wave, um, started in the winter of 1918, which the mousetrap work was resolved by November of 1918. Um, so it, it definitely uh, was there. Uh, Tom McIver, do you want to uh, unmute and ask your question, or do you want us to read it? Uh, I saw a question on chat. Uh, was it intended to kill? Um, yes, it was. It was. It was exceedingly lethal. Um, one of the advantages as a war gas <coughs> was that um, mustard gas took about uh, ten hours to affect the, the uh, people who were um, exposed to it. Um, in fact, the first soldiers thought it was a, uh, a ruse because it, it wasn't uh, asphyxiating like chlorine or, or phosgene, and they just smelled the, uh, the smell of uh, mustard. Um, they took off their masks, and about 10, 10 hours later, the symptoms started to, to appear. Um, Lewisite was a, a vesicant, so if you got it on your skin, it would rapidly uh, dissolve your skin, um, produce Lewisite oxide, which would then travel through your blood and, and kill you very quickly. Um, so the production at the mousetrap was um, 10 tons per day. So one day's worth of production, if launched into Cleveland, would have been enough to depopulate the entire city. Um, Lewisite was dumped into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, yes. Um, it was dumped uh, into the Chesapeake Bay, um, not just uh, in 1918, but continually up until the 1970s when um, we signed the uh, chemical uh, weapons ban and became serious about destroying our stockpiles of chemical weapons. Um, so 300 tons sounds like a lot. Um, but remember, this is 1918. Um, in World War II, we produced about 45,000 tons of lewisite. 
And the Russians produced even more. Um, they ended up dumping 100,000 tons of lewisite underneath the, uh, the uh, polar ice caps um, as a way to entomb it. So there are areas in the Chesapeake Bay to this day which have dead zones, which are attributed to the chemical weapons uh, dumping um, in the bay. All right. How are they planning to deliver this? Um, it could have been delivered both by, um, by plane as a sprayer. So um, the electrostatic sprayer used for crop dusting has been around for almost 100 years as well. And it was designed to be sprayed out of airplanes onto cities, onto troops. Um, the 3,000 tons that were ordered by the Army was essentially enough to spray the entire uh, area of Germany until, until Germany surrendered. Um, okay. Um, we have great oysters uh, coming from the Chesapeake Bay. Agree. So one good thing about arsenic is it's very common in seawater already. Arsenic is the 20th most common element in the Earth's crust, and all of our seafood has arsenic in it. Um, the interesting, interesting thing about arsenic is that um, it gets uh, methylated and turned into organic compounds such as arsino sugars, arsino lipids, and uh, arsino betaine is a big one. So when you eat uh, lobsters or shellfish, you get a lot of arsenic but it's in a chemical form that passes right through you. So arsino um, you could eat, you could basically eat as a spoonful and it would just go right through you where, you know, a few milligrams of inorganic arsenic, uh, if you ate, would kill you within a matter of hours. So the, the chemical form of arsenic is very important. Um, and remember, lewisite was very reactive to um, water. So this is one of the reasons I'm confident that any Lewisite activity in Willoughby um, would no longer be remaining as a uh, threat. It would be uh, it would be absorbed into the water table, and you know it would react with microbes, and they would methylate it and and turn it into the non dangerous organic compounds. That's so, dangerous organic compounds. Mike. So dumping it in in the water was actually probably a pretty good way to get rid of it, unlike some of the uh, other agents which are persistent. Uh, my grandfather was in the first gas regiment. He reported to the American University at the beginning of the program and served in France. He used phosgene, thermite, and smoke bombs. Would they have heard anything about lewisite being deployed? So at the armistice in November 11, um, supposedly the first load of lewisite was traveling uh, by ship to, uh, to the conflict in Europe. And the rumor is, is that instead of um, dumping the uh, ship, they just sank the ship. Um, you know, if you had leaking barrels, you know, you're really going to go through them and figure out which one's leaking. Um, so the, the uh, you know, the, the simple solution was just to sh sink the ship that they were being carried on. Um, questions. Um, we might have time for one more question. Oh, uh, this is Mark Gilvin. I have a qu another question. Um, do you have any feel for the relative um, percentage of the casualties among the soldiers caused by these various poison gases compared to other causes of their death, like uh, bullets and munitions? Yes, so there was actually only, and you know, it's hard to say this, but 1,500 um, gas deaths in the U.S. Uh, Army. So it wasn't very effective uh, once the masks were, were deployed with the troops. Um, in contrast to the 1,500 deaths, there were 900 deaths at Edward Arsenal preparing mustard gas. So it was arguably more dangerous to prepare the chemical weapons than it was to be on the battlefield facing their use. Do you have a question? You couldn't control the gas. Oh, um, I, I understand that it's the pro biggest problem with gas on the battlefield was that you because of the wind, you couldn't uh, control where it would go. Um, right, yes, that was a big problem. Um, the meteorologists were, were in charge of the, uh, the use of the gas because if the wind shifted, um, the gas would blow right back on you. But you know, by 1917, the gas use was so prevalent that no one knew who was shooting at who. They were just coating the whole field with mustard and phosgene and chloropicrin 
and um, Cyanogen, who is uh, just a, a hellish, a hellish, I can't even imagine. Um, I watched the movie, um, um, was it 1917? And that, that just really just brought it home how horrible the conditions were um, um, for, for our uh, soldiers. Yeah, with all the coronavirus, I forgot about that movie coming out. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, I uh, recommend it. I liked it. Cool. All right. I think that, uh, Glenn, are we out of time? We are. One last uh, plug. Um, I'm not set on the name, but for the idea, uh, I did create a face page called the March for Science Atonement. Uh, please find it and like it. And, and let's let's do it. I really like the idea of having a... Uh, you know, a, a day of lectures, uh, walking around uh, Willoughby, trying different bars and different food. And I, I think it really has potential for, for um, us to do something that may even get, get a little bit of a national spotlight on Cleveland. Yeah, I, we might have to wait until after there's a vaccine, though. Yeah. yeah. So this fall might not be the time to do it. Yeah, well, I, I started thinking about it a year ago before the vaccine, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, we can we can talk about it later.